All right. Good afternoon and evening to everyone in Asia Pacific and good morning to all in Europe and uh, very, very early morning uh, to some of those uh, from the US. I'm Julian Gordon. I'm the VP for Asia Pacific for Hyperledger and I'm delighted to be here today introducing this special in-depth Hyperledger member webinar with Bondi Value on their Bond Blocks Bond Exchange. The flow for today is we will start with introductions, then a special presentation on Bond Blocks by Raj Kanan, who's the co-founder and CTO of Bondi Value, followed by a distinguished panel with Q&A. And what an amazing panel we have with us today, a truly expert lineup of leaders in blockchain and capital markets. And they're all part of the team that made the world's first blockchain-based bond exchange possible, Bond Blocks Bond Exchange, which allows investors to trade thousand-dollar fractions of traditional wholesale bonds. So please sit back and get ready to listen to this discussion of how Bondi Value democratized corporate bond trading using enterprise blockchain, how the team solved the tech, regulatory, and accessibility challenges to open up this international trillion-dollar market to individual investors and how you can get involved. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the Q&A function in the Zoom chat just at the bottom down here and submit them there. And we're gonna gather questions and some we will answer during, uh, the, uh, during the discussion and, and then we'll also have a Q&A at the end. And with that, I'd like to ask each panelist to briefly introduce yourselves and your role in this era. In this area. Uh, we'll go alphabetically uh, so starting with Arjit. So Arjit, could you please introduce yourself, please? Arjit. Sure. Thank you, Julian. Uh, my name is Arjit Das, I'm, and I'm head of uh, Digital Asset Innovation Technology at the Northern Trust, based out of Chicago. And my background is I've been in the uh, industry with technology, finance, and banking for about 30 years across different, different banks. I've had different roles. But what um, I currently do is I, I lead a team of uh, developers uh, and technologists who focus on emerging technologies and how it's relevant to our business. And uh, in that context, I've had the pleasure to work with uh, Raj and Rahul and the others in the team um, to come up with what you were describing, Julian. And it's been an exciting journey and uh, looking forward to talk more about it. Thank you. I'd like to know Arajit is up at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Away from Chicago, I believe. So thank you. Uh, and I think next I'll go to Raj alphabetically. Thank you. All right. Uh, I was just wondering if you're going to get the alphabet fix right. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. <laughs> thanks so much. It's great to see such a big uh, participation. And uh, uh, thanks, Julian, for bringing this panel together. Um, so uh, I'm the co founder and CTO at Bondi Value. Uh, I'm, I have worked uh, over the last maybe 25 years across uh, various technology roles uh, in finance, uh, across both technology companies and financial services companies. Uh, and uh, it includes from hardcore development, architecting, solutioning, all the way through to more business focused roles like uh, uh, product management, uh, pre-sales, marketing. Uh, and uh, ultimately my last role I used to head treasury markets technology at uh, DBS Bank's Hyderabad Center. So uh, at Bondi Value, of course, I manage uh, all of the technology, but I also occasionally wear the business hat as needed. Okay. Thank you, Raj. And you're based in India, right? I'm based in India. So Chicago, India. And then Ryan, could you give a little intro? Yeah. Hi everyone, great to be here. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, so I'm based in London um, and I'm the global head of DLT and digital innovation at Citibank Security Services Division. Um, so my team are responsible for internal and external initiatives um, covering a broad range of um, digital um, and, uh, technologies, including things like tokenization um, and digital assets. So it's really good to be here today. I think I'm in the minority. I'm not a technologist. Um, my background is, is operations and products. Um, so my role currently sits within the, the front office product organization at City, but, but obviously we reach out across our organization and across our O&T partners. Okay, thank you, Ryan. So what I was asked to do now is to start the event, is kind of set the scene by giving a very brief explanation of blockchain technology and why it's so key to making all what we're going to talk about today possible, uh, where Hyperledger fits in and how that supports the amazing work by Bondi Value. And I'm going to do that by 
just quickly sharing a slide or two. Yeah, they're there. I'll share that with everyone. Can you all see that? Can you see my slide? Yes. Yeah. All right. So, um, so on this slide, and, and as I said, I'm going to give a quick brief uh, explanation of, of, of blockchain technology and, and where Hyperledger fits in and how that supports the work that we're doing today. So on this slide, you can read a very simple description that I think covers all blockchains. Uh, blockchain technologies allow multiple different parties to securely interact with the same universal source of truth that they can all trust. So the key here is trust. Once you have trust between multiple parties, uh, you can create many exciting new business opportunities and you can vastly improve many existing uh, operations. In very brief, blockchain is a decentralized ledger that allows all users to see one universal source of truth. Once something is written onto a blockchain, it cannot be tampered with, it is immutable, the ability to protect against fraud, inaccuracies, and to streamline operations, cut costs, and improve efficiencies is revolutionary. And that's what we're seeing today in enterprise blockchain. In the bond, in the bond blocks case, you will hear from Raj, who's going to, going to present after me uh, on, the, on bond blocks, uh, the many benefits of using blockchain including the ability to settle at T plus zero. So that's instant settlement of bond transactions. Uh, there is no need for reconciliation as on a blockchain, everyone is working with one immutable universal source of truth. Secondly, he will show how blockchain gives the ability to create new products such as fractionalized bonds. So that's, that's blockchain. Also, we want to be clear what type of blockchain we are discussing today, which is Enterprise blockchain is what we're using today. So I've kind of, and I think one of the best ways to do that is to look at the at the history of blockchain. So I kind of put it into three phases. 2008 was Bitcoin, uh, and that was the amazing Satoshi, whoever she they were, we don't know, right? And they pulled together that white paper and created uh, a, a Bitcoin, which is a cryptocurrency. And then after five years. We had the, uh, the third, the second kind of phase I look at uh, was Ethereum. That was uh, the genius of Vitalik uh, and the vision of a one world computer. And that's also another key thing was the invention of the smart contract, putting logic on top of, of, of a blockchain. So, but those both uh, are permissionless. And that was a challenge for, for businesses uh, and uh, for, uh, for, uh, for enterprises. One in terms of regulatory uh, concerns, one in terms of performance at that time. So a lot of uh, businesses, and I was around at that time, 2000, 2015, 16, said that we'd like to create enterprise blockchain, which has a kind of KYC. We know who's involved in it. There's no mining uh, and it's fit for purpose uh, for businesses at that time. At that time, uh, there were a number of, uh, of efforts uh, going, uh, being uh, uh, developed around the world and High Pleasure became a place along with the Linux Foundation where people came together and started developing uh, DLTs uh, or enterprise uh, DLTs, what we call in permissioned. So it has the KYC, all parties are known, it's in a controlled environment, improves performance and is, is better from a regulatory perspective. So I just want to make sure we understand we're not looking at cryptocurrency here. We're looking uh, at uh, enterprise uh, blockchain. And I'm just going to show you very quickly. This is uh, all the technologies within uh, uh, Hyperledger. Ultimately, we're an open source uh, uh, software uh, uh, initiative from the Linux Foundation. Uh, and we have a number of different platforms. And today we're going to be looking at, at Sawtooth, which you can see up on the top right hand there. So Raj, that was a quick covering of blockchain and, and our technologies and what enterprise blockchain is. I'm now going to pass you over to show how you are using this technology today. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Julian, for that introduction and uh, really setting this up uh, in terms of what's a blockchain and the benefits of a blockchain and the evolution itself, right? And uh, uh, so what I would like to do today is to talk a little bit about the bond block solution, right? Um, I hope uh, you can see my screen. Just taking a, uh, so, uh, and then talk, uh, spend a little bit of time explaining what is bond blocks, 
but I would like to dive in a little more into how bond blocks itself is implemented and how the underlying uh, ledger works. So with that, I'll just get into uh, who we are at Bondi Value. And I, we are a team of uh, bond market experts, technologists, uh, and we are best defined by our vision, which is a world where more investors can trade bonds on the go without restrictive minimum investments. And we'll just talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, and we have implemented this via a fully regulated bond exchange that's based on blockchain. And of course, we'll talk a lot more about this uh, as we go forward. So some of the key pain points in the bo existing bond markets. The bond market technology has not changed significantly in the last several decades, even though the underlying uh, uh, bonds uh, have issuances or trading of bonds has exploded like you know maybe a hundred times over, right? Uh, trading still happens over phone calls. The minimum ticket sizes uh, of bonds are typically in the US dollar 200,000 range, which makes it inaccessible for millions. Uh, it's also predominantly non-exchange traded, which hurts price transparency, uh, and also it's largely illiquid. So other asset classes, stocks, forex, commodities, etc., which are all uh, OTC, non-exchange traded, have moved to electronic exchanges, and we want to uh, make bonds the next to trade on exchanges. Um, the complexity of bonds requires deep domain and technology, so that's why it has not really happened to the extent it should, uh, and uh, that's where the bond blocks, bond exchange comes into being. So we are live today. We are an electronic exchange uh, that allows you to trade bonds like equities. It's transparent uh, and it's fair as an exchange. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, you can see our live pricing uh, on both Refinitive and Bloomberg. Uh, so it's available on all of you if you're familiar with that. Uh, there are also dedicated pages that you can find. Uh, so what is bond blocks, right? It's the world's first fractional bond exchange where you can, where you can actually trade a minimum of $1,000. Um, we are regulated by the MAS and uh, we follow like any of the regulated exchanges. We are not direct to consumer. We are not crypto. Uh, we work through our partners, our trading members. Uh, so it's a B2B2C model where banks, asset managers, uh, new B2C fintechs, brokers, market makers, et cetera, are members. And, and then some of them like banks or brokers can provide indirect access. Uh, in order to uh, create, facilitate this market, they can uh, integrate to us via various mechanisms, including full scale uh, integrations to their existing platforms or APIs. Uh, or we also have a very quick go to market uh, ability for them using our readily deployable trading applications. Um, we are integrated with global custodians uh, and uh, they act to safeguard all the client monies and assets on the exchange. Uh, so uh, with both Northern Trust and City, who as I'm sure all of you are aware are, are probably the, the largest custodians in the world. And uh, of course, we're very honored to have Orijit and Ryan on this panel, and they'll, they'll be able to share a lot more of their experience as well. So how does this work? Um, so I, I wanted to use uh, a couple of examples or exam a uh, couple of the flows that we have to give you an insight into how this works. Uh, how does T plus zero or instant settlement work? How does the fractionalization work, right? And what is the kind of anonymity we have? So with that, let me start by look, talking about fractionalization. Uh, so the fractionalization of bonds uh, conceptually is very much like depository receipts, if you're familiar with it. Um, so if you look at what happens, a market maker who's a member on our exchange uh, can bring in a bond, let's say 200K of uh, a HSBC perpetual bond by transferring it to, to our custodians. And, and then the custodians then, uh, Customize and safeguard the bonds, and they confirm receipt of this to the blockchain, right? So this actually is in the form of a transaction to the blockchain, and they just confirm it to their nodes. When, when that happens, I'm just going to segue into what then happens under the hood. So we use Hyperledger Sortie, and uh, what then happens under the hood is that the transaction gets distributed to all the nodes in the network. Uh, one of the nodes, we use PBFT consensus, 
So we've looked at various consensus and PBFT uh, is both uh, 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 non-forking. Uh, so we don't want to wait like, uh, like existing exchanges on crypto that are on proof of stake blockchains, right? Where they have to wait, it, it can fork. So they'd wait for money to get created. So PBFT has a funny about it's also Byzantine fault tolerance, so it defends the network. Um, oops. Uh, so uh, the node, one of the nodes plays the role of a leader and this is rotational and it distributes, it orders these blocks, uh, orders these transactions into blocks and uh, distributes it to all nodes. And then the transactions are executed by all nodes. So, uh, so it, in the blockchain system, it isn't that one node executes the transaction and just sends the results to everyone. All nodes actually execute and this is how it is, how it defends itself, right? And, than just uh, traditional databases where data can just get passed across to each other. Um, all nodes then compare results with each other and a node will then begin to commit only if two thirds of the network, greater than two thirds have identical results. So it ensures that uh, no nodes can, uh, can have, or, or a set of nodes if they have uh, changed the way transactions are processed, right? The, the network can still defend itself against that. Right, and each node then commits that block to its ledger. So if you go back to our use case, the custodian has passed this transaction, it's gone to all the nodes, uh, the consensus process has run, and, and then what then happens is that the ledger gets updated and one-to-one -one back bond blocks are created on the blockchain. So all the ledger, uh, all the ledger and all the nodes update, uh, and you can see there's an anonymous account uh, for the market maker. Uh, we don't store PII or anything else on, on the blockchain. Um, and this is uh, $200,000 are available off that bond, but in fractions of $1,000, right? And uh, one of the really cool things about, uh, about uh, some of the blockchain networks, including uh, Sawtooth, is that you can, uh, each node will then send out events. So anybody connected to that node will actually receive that update instantaneously via events. Um, the cash component also works the same way. So if, if a member wants to buy, sell or buy bond blocks, they can transfer cash to our custodians and the custodian follows the same process. The network follows the same process to create that cash holding in their bond blocks accounts. Um, we also allow for uh, bonds to uh, be funged back. So we call it a dual fungible structure. So they can be funged in. And in a similar process, if a market maker wants to take the 200,000 back to the secondary market, they can do so. And the custodian then confirms the transfer to the, to the network and all the nodes update and the ledger is again updated. So we'll take a look also at the trading flow, right? Uh, so in the trading flow, uh, firstly, I've just depicted a market maker account and a, uh, and a member who can be a bank or broker who's allowing indirect access to their uh, clients. So the client now has funded their account with $1,500. Uh, it's all there on the blockchain. Uh, the market maker then places an order and they, can, they don't need to place a 200K big order. They can place multiple orders in as low as 1K. Uh, the member's client places an order through the member to buy for 1K. At, and then the exchange, like any other exchange, we use a central limit order book and we match orders, right? And so you'll see that these two orders match and we then send a confirmation of the trade to the blockchain. So in today's market infrastructure, typically these confirmations, they take, they have to be sent to multiple participants because every participant maintains their own set of records uh, and so on. And uh, it, it kind of takes a long time for all of that to reconcile and process, which is why you end up with that T plus two settlement. Uh, the magic of our setup and the underlying blockchain is, is this, right? So once the confirmation comes in, uh, the ledger and all the nodes update via the same consensus process and transaction execution process. The settlement is instantaneous because we, all of us have the same single source of truth. And uh, immediately the market maker's account and the member's client, uh, member's client account shows those updates uh, and uh, as always, the, 
blockchain can efficiently communicate this out instantaneously via events to all participants. So the member within a few seconds and the market maker within a few seconds can, can see that um, on whatever interface they're using to connect to the exchange. Right, so from our perspective, the blockchain basically provides, uh, and, I, and uh, uh, Julian had spoken about it, there's the single source of record, but it's just the way that single source of record, which is distributed securely, it is processed securely, it's immutable, et cetera. And uh, you know, for us, we also found that it's really super efficient uh, way of communicating the transactions, changes to the uh, ledger to all participants. So, of course, the benefits, it improves efficiency, it's, it increases trust, and uh, therefore it reduces reconciliation efforts, resulting in that T plus zero settlement. Right? Uh, it also enables new models of execution. So we just saw the fractionalization um, flow as well. So with that, I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the challenges of doing this. Uh, proof of concepts are easy, right? It took us maybe a couple of people, a couple of months on the outside, right? To learn something new and set up something, try out a couple of transactions, see how the ledger updates. Uh, and typical small proof of quick proof of concepts will, uh, will result in you figuring out whether it's uh, how usable it is, but uh, uh, it really it's not usable uh, outside of the proof of concept. Uh, production is really hard, right? So why, why is production hard? What you want is this screen. What you want your clients to experience is something like this, right? Uh, in order to achieve this, you, you, need to, uh, uh, you need to follow all the good, other good practices that you follow for your other applications. So you need to be able to uh, have the application, have high availability, have monitoring, um, you know, be able to deploy updates to the application itself and so on and so forth, right? Reporting. Uh, so what we have done to achieve this, and this is where it, it then took us, let's say a couple of dozen engineers, like a year and a half to get there, right? is, uh, is to build this. And we use, uh, you know, we use cutting edge serverless technology on top of our blockchain network to, uh, to synchronize it with external uh, databases to combine data to provide uh, uh, you know, rich, yeah, very uh, enriched data to the front end. Uh, and all of this from the back, all the way from the blockchain, all the way through to the front end is all event driven. So you get things as and when they happen instantaneously. So what are some of the challenges and lessons learned? Uh, um, I, this is something that's really critical. This technology paradigm is still new, right? Um, uh, oftentimes today with a lot of tech, newish technologies, some of them, we say technologies are new, they're five, six years old still. So uh, so if you take uh, on the front end, you take React.js or you take Node.js or you take Java, right? You can just go to Stack Overflow and you find almost all kinds of solutions, right? Uh, this paradigm is new. There, there, isn't, there aren't that many people who have experienced it to the degree that, uh, uh, that you actually get answers easily. So, so in our case, we had to, we have actually gone through several hundreds of thousands of lines of, uh, uh, of logs, have gone through the actual code, have compiled and built the underlying platform because it's all open source, made some changes and seen how that works, right? So we, you need to have that level of commitment. Um, the deployment of updates, again, it requires a coordinated effort because now every trans every node operator needs to have the same transaction processor work the exact same way. Otherwise, the consensus will fail. So uh, if you had a web app, you could simply make updates uh, anytime, either if you find a defect or if you want to quickly add some new features. Uh, but in the case of a blockchain network, you've got to be a lot more deliberate, right? So what you need to have is really good, robust processes, agreements, guidelines uh, between all of the node operators and uh, also ensure you have to take double care that your smart contracts are really well designed, reviewed, tested before every production release. Uh, there's very little way to go back once you go forward right on this. Um, the blockchain may not be uh, the best execution platform for very complex transactions. So it all depends on your use case, of course. But uh, 
uh, oftentimes we get asked this question of TPS, right? And it kind of reminds me of, uh, in India, we always ask questions when, whether we go uh, and look at a Ferrari or whether we go to buy, uh, you know, like your family sedan, we ask how much mileage does it give, right? So that question is, uh, is probably relevant. Is you have to treat it as horses for courses. But having said that, there are a couple of things to note, right? Um, if you have a network of, uh, if you have five nodes, five computers, then your, uh, uh, in, a, in your, uh, and you had a web application, you can actually distribute requests across all five and they'll handle different requests. In the blockchain network, all five are actually executing the same transaction. Um, but having said that, this, a uh, way of executing the same transaction and then updating the ledger at different, uh, 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 that's maintained with different participants, uh, it brings great efficiency. That's why we are able to go from T plus two to T plus zero. So that's really the benefit, right? Uh, and therefore you need to balance what work you do on and what work you do off chain. Um, we talked about that the data in our network is anonymized. So we need to be able to combine both off-chain data and enrich it, sorry, uh, on-chain data and enrich it with uh, off-chain data. We need to be able to integrate it with our existing uh, applications, existing infrastructure. So you need to account for that uh, if you really want to go to uh, production. And uh, lastly, you need to think of how would you do uh, disaster recovery? How would you maintain availability? So as a regulated exchange, we have certain obligations to our members, right? So a certain recovery time objective that might be in, let's say four hours at the most. But of course, if anything is down, then our entire market is disrupted. It also causes uh, other issues in terms of uh, trust and so on. So you need to plan for how you would uh, take care of that. How do you monitor your network? How do you automate recovery? How do you automate uh, reconciliations if you're using your external database and, and the ledger and so on. Um, so this, this is what it will take for you to get from the POC to production, right? With that, I'd like to uh, stop here and, uh, uh, and then you, know, you can reach me uh, at this. If you have any, any questions, I'll try to answer a few during the course of the panel as well. But uh, I'd like to get back to Julian now and uh, thank everyone for for listening to me. Julian, over to you. I'm on mute, exactly. <laughs> that was a great, great presentation. Thank you. The challenges, opportunities, why you're using, uh, using Sawtooth. Um, and that, that was really, really, really good. Thank you. Uh, so now what, the, what we're going to do in the next 15, 20 minutes, we've got to, we're going to talk to the panel. Yeah? Uh, and then we're going to take some cute. I see a bunch of questions coming in, so please continue those questions, some of them technical, some of the business, please. And, I, and I'll ask the panelists those questions as well. But I'm going to first start with, um, uh, and I think I'll start with Arajit because he's, he's more fresh and early than all of us. So uh, <laughs> where do you see a blockchain being imperative and proving and reinventing the financial infrastructure? It's kind of like what we're doing at, that Bondi Valley has done. Yeah, thank you, Julian. And uh, excellent presentation, Raj. That was, uh, that was great. Um, so yeah, blockchain, uh, as, as we in the financial industry all, all recognize, is probably a, a, a game-changing technology. And, and we first got, from Northern Trust point of view, involved in this uh, five plus years ago, uh, when we began to recognize that you, know, you, you're, you have a technology which gives us the ability to, to share information, but also share operational processes in, in, a, in a trusted immutable manner across various parties. And if you really look at a macro level, financial institutions really do that. They, they have established operational procedures, they have data and they share that amongst different parties. And because traditionally these methods of sharing has had to have a reconciliation uh, layered on top of it and, and other operational processes, it, it has sometimes been cumbersome. But with blockchain, we recognize that, that there, there's perhaps the ability to do that uh, very efficiently with the network itself. So um, having recognized that, we, we made our first foray into this blockchain world with, uh, uh, with an application in the private equity space. And then we used Hyperledger Fabric um, to develop that. This was, uh, uh, I don't remember exactly, but five, five or so years ago, 
we launched it live with, with, with uh, you know, private equity funds. And we leveraged this capability of blockchains to bring some efficiencies into the capital call process uh, for private equity funds. Um, since then, obviously, lots of different things have happened. And, and when Raj and Rahul came up with this fantastic use case for blockchains, uh, we were very excited uh, to be part of it. Uh, but coming back to your question, the, the fundamental disruption that we see here is, at least I see uh, here, is that um, you, for the first time, you have the ability uh, for different institutions and participants to trust the operational processes without the need for a central party to, to endorse it. So once you have all the different participants agree that they are going to um, operate on a certain set of data um, in a certain way, and that is distributed across the network, the, the role of the central party is, is somewhat diminished. And that gives rise to lots of different ways in which we can get operational efficiencies. We, can, we, we, do, not, we do not have to uh, spend so much time and effort on reconciliation processes. And it also gives rise to newer products like the fractionalization of bonds that, that Raj talked about. Um, but there's other products that, that, is, that is going to come up. So I do think this is a game changing technology and, and you know, no one can really predict the future. So we'll have to see and, and go along the journey of this, this exciting story as it unfolds. Yeah, excellent. So yeah, a lot, a lot happening, a lot happening there, right? Um, so Ryan, would you want to add to, to that? Yeah, sure. So, so just to just to comment on Erajit's um, view, and then and then also just to add um, some additional views from me. So, so I, I very much agree with Erajit's um, assessment, right? So, so blockchain is really about sharing real time data across an ecosystem in an immutable and trusted way. Okay, so it's really about breaking down data silos. And if we can move to a world where a, a value chain is sharing the same set of data, then we can start to synchronize processes across us. Okay, so processes today are supported sequentially along a value chain. There's lots of duplication, there's lots of messaging and reconciliation to keep entities in check. It's feasible that actually those workflows could be deployed centrally onto a um, blockchain and each of those entities enrich the transaction um, uh, in line with their own service provision. So that's a really, really interesting concept. Clearly that can speed up informational flow, speed up settlement as we're seeing in bonded value, but also make the end-to-end -end transaction life cycle significantly more efficient as well. Um, just to add a couple of additional thoughts. So um, one use case of blockchain is tokenization as we're seeing here with bonded value. Um, and, and bond of value are really leading the charge here with regards to bonds. But that, that concept can also be extremely interesting for other asset classes, things like alternative assets, private equity, for instance, that have significantly longer and less efficient transaction life cycles. So there's a really interesting near-term near opportunity to, to make those kinds of investments significantly more efficient. And I think the final thing I'd add here is that um, the way blockchain is being deployed in some use cases is if it effectively creates a always on 24 by 7 cross border network. OK, so this has the potential to really change market structure um, and it's it's feasible that in the medium term, we could start to see markets operating cross border 24 hours a day and settling same same time, same day maybe even real time. Right? So that, that, that's a really interesting concept. This is not just about investment flows in country, this is cross-border investment flows, and, and it could really have a revolutionary impact on all of our business models. Yeah, I, I think from what I see, multi-CBDC seems to be the thing, right? This is going to be the wholesale CBDCs could revolutionize how settlement done real time. There's a lot of work almost done here at HKMA but the MAS is also working on that. So yeah, a, a, a lot of possibilities. So what, what do you think? Raj, do you want to add to that? Any, any thoughts yourself there? I think, uh, I think both uh, Ryan and, uh, and Arjit have covered it. I, I think some of the use cases that we talked about are totally enabled because of uh, 
the the power of this framework, right? Um, so okay, so we know it's it's the right thing. It's happening here, uh, but and bonds, but but I think lots of other places. And actually, in a previous webinar, we talked about that bonds are kind of always been underrepresented and, and difficult to get to, and that's what this is obviously enabling. Uh, you know, uh, more people to get access uh, to bonds, but it's been a challenge, surely. You know, there's there's been some challenges. So what 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 have been the challenges? Uh, and we look from, from a technology perspective, from a custodian perspective. So maybe I'll start with Ryan on that one, right? What what what, what do you see the challenges, obviously, on, on this? Yeah, I mean, there, there, ha there has been challenges um, naturally. I, I think one of the um, one of the key challenges for us all is just the sh sheer fragmentation of use cases and technologies uh, and standards uh, across across the globe, right? So. Um, as an industry, we've been pretty good at getting to standardised messaging and workflows and market practice over the years, right? This is a, um, there's not one one type of blockchain, okay? There, there's many different types of blockchain and there's many different ways that, that, that those protocols are implemented. And then on top of that, there's many different market practices and standards that, that, that define how that network is used, right? So, what we're seeing is we're seeing a huge number of use cases with a, a large number of um, uh, implementation types and a large number of protocols. And that can be quite daunting, right? So, that, so certainly for, for investors that, that might just want to get access to the asset and, and are not really um, that concerned by the technology, right? So I think the, um, the challenge for us all is to, uh, certainly as, as service providers, is to really try and abstract that complexity and build solutions that connect our clients into those markets in a scalable and streamlined way uh, and, and potentially make them backward compatible as well. Okay, so if clients do not want to change how they communicate, they do not want to change the formats they use, um, then they should be able to continue with them changing their own time but still get access to the market. So I think that's really key to ensure that we can minimize the barriers to, to adoption and allow, allow these new networks to scale. Um, I think the other thing I'll just highlight here is just regulatory uncertainty. Okay, so I think um, uh, naturally regulators are um, interested in anything new. Um, what we need to try and differentiate here is, is, the, is the asset class and the services that are being provided from the technology itself. Okay, so, so clearly if the asset class is new, if the service is being provided a new, that should require a, a, an in-depth regulatory dialogue. But actually if just the technology um, is different, okay, then actually there should, um, th th should be um, a, a very close discussion with regulators to help them understand that actually the nature of the services are, are the same, but the underlying technology may be different and helping them to understand what that means right so i think it's incumbent on us all to really work with regulators as, as this ecosystem evolves um, to help them to, to understand really where the key risks are um, and where they need to focus their their minds okay i think the regulator is key and i think we'll talk about that maybe a little you know this went through a sandbox i think that may be a key to to, to its success so Arajit, do you, do you want to maybe add to those? I'm sure you've had uh, similar and, and other challenges. Yes, and, and I agree with uh, with everything that Ryan was uh, saying there. You know, the regulatory challenges are are there, uh, less so for an existing asset class, as he says. It, it's, it's if you start, you know, talking about completely new asset classes, it's a lot more challenging. But for me, I I, I have more of a technical lens, um, and and uh, really my problems that I had to solve was or one around the standards that, that Brian already mentioned, because not only are there so many different types of blockchains, but there's like different ways of interacting with them. There's, uh, there's all sorts of network requirements, which are different, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, just following up on, on something that, that Rod said that, you know, lab is easy, production is hard. I mean, and boy, did we find that out when we were trying to deploy this thing, right? Uh, and also for our private equity uh, application that we did, because it works great in, in a, in a quote-unquote sandbox lab environment. But the moment you try to 
even installing it in a production environment or even a production like environment uh, enterprise environment is very challenging you know you start off start off by saying that oh i can't connect to anything because all my firewalls and proxies and everything block all connections um i you know what i try to install hyperledger it wants to go pull something down from github and you know can't do that and then and then then you know once you got it up and running etc then you realize that you know, oh, now I can't just let it run in isolation because, you know, if you, if you remember the use case, there are two legs to this. There is the real world, quote unquote, real world uh, fiat leg. And then you have the blockchain leg and they have to meet somewhere, right? So, so now you can't just have this little thing on the side. It's got to become part of your enterprise, you know, overall uh, mesh. And, and you know, to, to connect them together, again, become extremely challenging uh, from a technology point of view while maintaining that abstraction that Ryan was talking about so that you don't have to redo this for every single different type of blockchain that you start connecting with. So, so architecting all of that, getting it through the information security groups, understanding all the different protocol subtleties that are needed, the operational oversight, the monitoring, the triggers, <laughs> because our operational groups and support groups have to understand you know, what triggers are relevant in the in this environment to react and, and what are the are not because it's not like traditional systems. So I can go on and on and on, but but there were a lot of challenges. So so anyone who wants to undertake this journey, and if you've seen something that <clears throat> works great in a demo environment, don't be fooled. When you take it into a real production environment, you've got to, you've got work to do. It works. It works eventually, but there's blood, sweat, and tears involved. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. So it, it, it is a challenge, right? But hopefully a worthwhile challenge, right? So you've learned, yeah. you've learned lots and lots and lots of lessons from there. And actually what it seems to be, I, I hear again, is integration. Integration seems to be the issue. So you have, so maybe somebody else can answer this. You are in a, you have your own corporate enterprise kind of standards. A blockchain probably doesn't fit sweetly into, uh, into the you know, enterprise architecture framework. Is there any, anything who would advise anyone about how to make, you know, do that or help in, in that kind of environment, how they can bring blockchain lots in? Of, yeah, I mean, uh, lots of communication and education of the different enterprise streams early in the process is helpful because, um, you know, in a larger institution and, and you know, Northern Trust is a fairly large institution, not as large as Citibank, but, but we have uh, lots of different areas which have oversight about different things and not all of them have the same level of understanding of, of the technology. Um, I'm talking about within the technology groups, right? So you've got the information security group, you've got uh, the network group, et cetera, et cetera. So, so lots of communication, education, explanation, transparency as to exactly what you're trying to do um, helps alleviate people's concerns. It's like, you know, really shining the light on, on there's no mystery here. This is not magic. This is not witchcraft you can look inside and this is what's happening. And, and then people start getting to be comfortable. Uh, a lot of that is relationship and, and, and education and, and showing people what, what's happening under, under the hood so that they, they can start getting comfortable. That's how you navigate the, the, the corporate uh, you know, uh, groups. And, and just to add to that, so we've got, uh, the way I look at it, there's, there's two elements here. There's the there's technical services that are developed to connect into these networks, but also integrate into existing enterprise technology. That, that's one element of it. Uh, and that takes some really, um, uh, we need to really engineer that stuff, right? And we need to make it future-proof because these technologies are gonna change over time. But the second part, which is probably slower, is understanding how existing enterprise policies need to change for this technology. Uh, and that that takes, as Eric said, that takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and communication with key stakeholders across the firm, so they understand exactly why this is different. This is not bad. This is just different. Um, and then to get to the stage where we understand, okay, which policies need to change, why they need to change, and, and how they need to change. So that so that does take time. Yeah. Do you want to add more to that, Raj? Yeah, I think uh, 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 Arjit, uh, as Arjit was speaking, you know, I, I was I couldn't help smile because uh, I'll just give an example of, of some of the challenges, right? So uh, almost right before we went production last year, right, we were in UAT for quite a long time with Northern Trust, uh, and and we heard that 
every now and then their nodes would stop syncing up, right? And uh, uh, it, uh, it, we, we looked at the network configuration. So we, we went back to sort of the usual suspects, right? But, uh, uh, but it, it took us literally looking at, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of lines of logs to figure out that there was a version difference between our transaction process and what was deployed there, right? And, uh, and the minute we sorted that out, we were able to uh, you know, go really comfortably into production because until that point, right, there was always this thing that why is this happening, right? And we never had the answers. We really had to dig in. We really had to go and look at what Sawtooth itself was doing. We had to look at what we were doing, uh, ultimately just reviewing the code and, uh, sorry, the, the logs. And, uh, you know, th these are logs that are really hard to read, right? Like, um, because they're voluminous and uh, you really need that volume of logs to have the level of detail you need to dig in. Uh, so that's 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 an example of, of some of the difficulties. You know, many other cases, like I said, you can just type into Stack Overflow and say, you know, this is what is happening, and you get five answers, and you'll, you'll be able to figure out. But in this, there are no answers in Stock uh, Stack Overflow or any of the other forums yet, because this requires that level of experience, and you have to go through the blood, sweat, and tears that uh, as you've talked about. Exactly. This is all new, right? There's no new book. There's no book to refer to, right? Yeah. <laughs> we're all learning as, as we go as uh, we go along, right? Yeah. So, so actually, I think we're going to go to the Q and A now. We have about ten minutes left. Uh, so, actually, if you guys want to have a look at the, uh, the, the the panelists at the questions, but I think I think one is, it seems to come up is specifically maybe we can talk specifically. You know, what which bonds are what kind of bonds are now fractionalized on bond blocks? Right. Um, so, uh, so as on now, uh, we we have, uh, we are looking or we have fractionalized a number of bonds that are largely uh, investment grade. They are U.S. dollar or Sing dollar issuances, right? Uh, uh, we have about uh, twenty, I think, at this time listed, uh, but we keep listing continuously every month, and uh, and and we have a certain uh, criteria for the type of bonds that can be listed on the exchange. So we do not, uh, you know, we look at uh, we look at bonds that a are uh, are have a reasonable level of liquidity in the second mark, uh, secondary market, so that they uh, they are available to our participants on uh, as needed. Uh, and we also look at uh, you know the investment, uh, the creditworthiness of the issuer, uh, the kind of issuance, obviously the currency, the sector, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we continuously keep uh, adding every month right so our goal is to have maybe 100 bonds of the top bonds listed on on the exchange over the course of the year another direct question is how do they go and how do they go and see it i presume they can, there's a demo on site online and they can just uh to see the bonds or to see a demo of our uh, application sure. yeah how do you how do you trade how do i how do i how do i, how do I want to trade bonds? How do so I I've, I've, I've just posted an answer uh okay. you can reach out to me and of course we will make uh, some of this available uh, to experience uh, over a period of time on our site, but uh, anybody interested can reach out to me. So I've, I've just responded with my ID and reach out, we'll organize a demo for you. Actually, an interesting question here is this is obviously an operations play and, 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 it, and it creates a new opportunities, but is there any, how does it affect liquidity? Does it, will it help with liquidity or is that not known yet in, in, in bonds? Uh, maybe I'll take the first stab at this, right? So, uh, so certainly uh, operations and settlement efficiency is one of the benefits, which is the T plus zero. But uh, if you look at it, uh, we spoke about many of these bonds being uh, at a minimum uh, uh, trade lot, trading lot size of 200K, right? And uh, on the exchange, you can actually trade them, buy them at $1,000 minimum which we believe will actually significantly increase liquidity as well. So uh, uh, also other factors, right? It's exchange traded, you, have, uh, you know, you as a client, you don't have to trade over the phone call. You can see the price, so you can make decisions, you can click and buy. Uh, so I think all of this um, will exchange, uh, will increase liquidity. Okay, now, now the question that they're all asking is, how does this compare with why do you not choose Corda or Fabric or other DLCs? What was that? Why, why, why Sawtooth? Um, so, uh, good question. I think uh, 
so on the uh, every blockchain has its own uh, advantages has its own disadvantages has its own uh, has use cases that are uh, suited to that right so if i take something like coda for example uh, then uh, uh, coda is a blockchain uh, it is uh, it's very peer to peer in the way it works right so so if two participants want to exchange assets they they actually each sign that contract and then uh, and then the uh, you know there's a node network of notaries that will then ensure that uh, uh, they're not burning more, uh, you know thing, burning more assets than they have uh, and then uh, and both of them then can settle that uh, so there is uh, it is it's very peer to peer it's very uh, for me it's like how the otc markets work in a way right so um, uh, for an exchange uh, traded, we needed some uh, uh, a blockchain platform that will allow us to have this all-to-all -all kind of uh, uh, platform, right? So you're not going peer to peer, and and uh, so the Hyperledger family in general accomplishes that. But uh, Sawtooth, just to talk about Sawtooth, right? Why we chose Sawtooth? I think we we're also lucky on a couple of fronts on Sawtooth. A, it went to version one, which is so when it starts getting somewhat stable, at the time we started working on it, uh, and then PBFT on Sawtooth also came out around the same time. Uh, but fundamentally, Sawtooth is uh, uh, relative to many of the other blockchain networks. It's very simple to uh, simpler to deploy, right? It's got only one node type, so I mean you don't have to fight about what kind of nodes you uh, uh, you're going to install and allocate to whom. But also that uh, uh, one kind of node and there's one point of connection to other nodes. So uh, if you take Fabric, then you you uh, you have peers. The peers have to connect with each of the other peers to get agreement, to get validation of the transaction, and then they send it for ordering, and then there are committing peers. So you you kind of have a lot of points where you have to open up the networks. Uh, not so in uh, in uh, Sawtooth. Uh, much simpler to install. Uh, got it's got inbuilt. Uh, uh, you know, it's got permissioning. A lot of these blockchains al already do have, uh, so it's got good support for permissioning. It's got a good event framework, uh, and it's got a good uh, transaction processing framework as well. Okay, now we've got five minutes left. So one one quick question, maybe maybe a custodian question. It says, uh, "How do you manage the coupons on a bond?" I'm not sure. Maybe that's too specific. <laughs> How do you manage coupon payments on the underlying bonds? I presume that's. Uh yeah, I think I'll, I'll let Arjit answer. He's done a few of these now. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, from, from the from the business angle, we could jump in, right? But but from the from the technical flow angle, it's no different from from the other flows, right? So you the the picture that Raj showed earlier, where you had an event in like a, a transfer of a bond, similar event would happen to the custodian, which would be a, a coupon payment event coming from the depository, uh, and then that would trigger the same sort of flow that he, uh, he showed in this diagram, which is a transaction to the blockchain, informing the blockchain that, that this has have happened. And then there is internal algorithms that you, the, you have right in your, your system, which then sends that transaction and, and makes sure that the right participant gets the right part of it. So, so from the custodian point of view, it's, it's, it's very similar to all the other flows that we have on that. Okay, I think that makes sense, definitely. Um, so we've got another four minutes left. So I'm going to start with, with a kind of round robin question, right? Um, uh, kind of mark out of 10. So how far are we on this journey? I mean, this journey specifically for, for, for bond blocks is about providing comprehensive access for retail investors uh, to the global bond markets. Um, out of 10, where do you think we are today? And actually, this is something else. In, t in five or 10, 10, 10 years' time, how far do you think we'll be out of 10? So... I'm going to start with Arajit. <laughs> so Sorry. specifically for, for this use case, um, yeah. um, in, in blockchain in general, I would say we are, we are at a one because we are just getting started. We haven't quite hit the inflection point of where you have enough participants to really start changing the way the entire market behaves. So I would say at a one, and your second question was five years from now, um, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, but but it, it's probably going to be a five, if I were to guess. All right. Yeah. I, I, um, yeah, I'd agree with that. I think we're at one. Um, I think what we're starting to see now is we're starting to see real 
interesting use cases in production, such as bonded value. We're also starting to see some countries change issuer law uh, to allow native digital assets to be issued rather than tokenizing assets that already exist. So that's a really interesting evolution. Um, I'm probably not as uh, optimistic as Arajit in five years time. I think we'll probably still be around three, maybe four if we're lucky. I think this has got a real long way to, to run. Um, I think it's also uh, important to understand that in the short to medium term, the world's about to get a lot more complex. Um, we need to, we as in the service providers need to invest to connect into these networks and build solutions. But in the longer term, it will result in a much more efficient um, transaction life cycle and, and significant cost reductions as well. Okay, so that was, so we got, that was a, a, a three to four, right? And was it one to start with? Was it one to three? Yeah. To four? yeah. About a one to five. So, Raj, are you positive? Uh, I'm, I guess <laughs> not. This is the, this it, is the it, it, It's a bit uh, dicey to ask this <laughs> under the current circumstances. But yeah, uh, I, I think uh, I'm net positive on, on where uh, blockchain is. Uh, is uh, so I think today we are, of course, at, you know, in the early stages of that. Uh, uh, and we also have to remember that this is technology that uh, uh, that many of the fundamentals have been there. They're, the algorithms for many of these have been there from the 70s or 80s, right? So I think we sometimes, if you take a five, 10 year uh, look at it, we are already 40 years since when some of the building blocks have come in, right? And I think a progress in various other fields will also influence this. Uh, but I think we are somewhere in the, you know, two to three uh, mark right now. Um, and, you know, if you get to six uh, in a few years from now, we are, we are doing pretty well. Okay. How I You're a little bit more optimistic. So, excellent. I guess, I guess the paper is always, uh, it always shows that if you're on the technology side, <laughs> you tend to be maybe more optimistic. And I was uh, just going to say yeah. that. I mean, that divide is really <laughs> stark, right? The technologists <laughs> are always like, hey, we're going to change the world. <laughs> and then the other guys are like, not so fast. <laughs> And the custodians are, are, are practical, right? Is that right? Yeah, I think pragmatic. Uh, <laughs> but things are going. I did a webinar the other day, and it was uh, someone had a minus figure in five years for something else. So, <laughs> 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 this is all good. So this is progression, right? So, and I think it's it's a great it's a great story, and uh, you know, an amazing thing to have this live. And thank you, everybody here. You know, obviously, this is uh, um, uh, for, for for attending this this uh, webinar. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Arajit. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everybody, uh, for attending. Uh, we've got tons of questions. We'll see whether we can get to all of those afterwards. Uh, so I think I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Uh, keep safe. Uh, and um, hopefully see you uh, soon. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.